Good morning with everyone. It's uh, nice to be with you today. I'm here to speak with you about the new colorectal cancer screening uh, guideline updates. As an overview of my talk, I'm going to briefly touch upon some of the uh, points that were just beautifully illustrated by Dr. Istica. Um, then an overview of the, um, the screen modalities that are recommended by the USPSTF. Then a quick uh, overview of what the USPSTF is, followed by a review of the recommendation grading. Their 2016 recommendations, the 2020 recommendation update that just came out in October, response to that update uh, from the GI community, followed by some take home points. So colorectal, colorectal cancer is uh, the third leading cause of cancer death for both men and women with over 53,000 deaths uh, in the US in 2020 alone. As uh, Dr. Iska just pointed out, it is most frequently diagnosed between the ages of 65 to 74, but with over 10% of cases occurring in adults less than 50 years of age. And the recent uh, trends are showing that the incidence of colorectal cancer of 45 year olds is approaching that of 50 year olds. And as of 2016, quarter of eligible adults had never been screened. Now, I think before going further, it's important to note that this increased incidence is not a screening effect. Uh, and while colonoscopy is obviously being utilized more, and as you can see here, adults that had had a colonoscopy between ages 40 and 49 of the past 10 years had almost doubled from 2000 to 2013. However, as again, we were just discussed, the rapid gains uh, are being seen in patients that are in their 20s and 30s, and that the rates of uh, disease being diagnosed at early and advanced disease is similar, which would be incongruent with the screening effect. And the proportion of cases uh, being diagnosed in less than patient, patients less than 55 years of age has doubled in the past two decades. And in fact, those birth cohorts are approaching those of people born before 1900. Now, these are the stool-based uh, screening modalities that are recognized by the USPSTF and I know are well familiar to our audience. So I won't dwell too much on these here, but this is for your reference. However, certain things I'd like to point out are that given the frequency of all these testing, adherence will be an issue for you know, these types of screening tests. Now, there is good randomized controlled data to show reduction in mortality uh, with these, stool, these screening tests. However, you know, things like FOBT do require some dietary restrictions as well as three samples. Now FIT does have an advantage of having only a single sample. And while the stool DNA based testing, which is newer, doesn't have any direct evidence with regard to mortality yet, it does it has been shown to have increased sensitivity. But I think those of us who do a lot of screening uh, colonoscopies have encountered, what do you do when you now have a negative diagnostic colonoscopy in the setting of a patient that has a highly sensitive positive screening test? These are the direct visualization methods that are recognized by uh, the USPSTF. And again, I know well familiar to our audience, but certain things I'd like to point out would be that there is great data to show that there is reduction mortality and accuracy and in, in, uh, screening for adenomas and colon cancer with these uh, various testing strategies. And while flexible sigmoidoscopy is maybe less utilized as it has been in the past, it actually may be available in places where colonoscopy is not. And that randomized controlled data shows that if you combine flexible sigmoidoscopy every 10 years plus fit annually, there is a reduction mortality and modeling suggests that it may have benefits similar to colonoscopy with fewer complications. And I think also very particular to this lecture, when we are seeing that younger individuals diagnosed with colon cancer uh, are being, are ha predominantly have left sided lesions, flexible sigmoidoscopy may be adequate to visualize and at least screen for those lesions. Now, while we are talking about the USPSTF uh, today, I did want to briefly touch upon the United States Multi-Society Task Force uh, recommended screening modalities. Now, that is an expert panel of gastroenterologists from the ACG, the AGA, and the ASGE. They have three tiers of recommended screening tests with colonoscopy and FIT in the tier one. Tier two includes colonography and the stool DNA-based testing and flexible sigmoidoscopy, and tier three being capsule colonoscopy but not re recommended is the serum-based SEPTA-9 test. Now the USPSTF uh, was created in 1984 and is an independent volunteer panel of national experts in prevention evidence-based medicine. Their recommendations are based on a rigorous review of uh, peer-reviewed evidence and a letter grade is assigned. Of importance though, is that they, did, they do not consider costs in their recommendations. The United States Preventive Task Force provides these letter gradings here. You can see A through D and then an I statement. A and B are, often, are suggestions to provide that service. 
with the main difference being that the degree of how much the net benefit might be between the A and the B group. Group C uh, is a group where there's at least moderate certainty that the net benefit is small. And therefore the recommendation is that there should be an individualized discussion between the provider and the patient whether or not to proceed with the testing. Grade D would be, dis would be a uh, recommendation that the harms outweigh the benefits and therefore discourage use of that test. Whereas an I statement would be that there's insufficient evidence to conclude whether or not there is sufficient benefits over benefit for uh, over harm. This is here for mainly for your reference and self-explanatory, but it's just about their level of certainty with regard to net benefits in their recommendation grading system. So the 2016 recommendations, which they themselves were an update of the 2002 and 2008 recommendations, gave a letter grade A recommendation to offering screening to adults ages 50 to 75, with a letter grade C recommendation to adults ages 76 to 85 years of age, with the main people potentially benefiting would be those who had never had screening in the past. In order to update these guidelines, uh, the USPSTF commissioned two reports. One, a systematic review of the benefits and harms of beginning screening at 40 years and above, and then a cancer intervention and surveillance modeling network study looking at life years gain, colon cancer cases averted, and colon cancer deaths averted at various starting and stopping ages, accounting for these recent population trends and colorectal cancer incidents. As their draft statement uh, is here, it came out in October, and they maintained their A grade rating for offering screening for adults ages 50 to 75 and their grade C rating for adults ages 76 to 85, but now have added a grade B recommendation for offering screening to adults ages 45 to 49 years of age. Looking at what this uh, means in terms of uh, plain language, this, they found that there's a moderate certainty of moderate benefit and that benefit being decreased mortality and increased life years in screening patients ages 45 to 49 with a small risk of harm. In the 50 to 75 age range, that's a high certainty of substantial benefit. And then 76 to 85, a moderate certainty of small benefit with a small to moderate chance of harm, mainly coming from perforation and bleeding in that age, older age group. In response to this uh, uh, recommendation update, The Lancet issued an editorial. And they stated that while basing recommendations on modeling data is not without controversy, it is important that they've taken into account this increased trend in incidence of colorectal cancer in younger individuals. They did point out though, that while primary care providers were highly aware of the American Cancer Society's 2018 recommendations to begin screening at age 45, only 27% of those providers to actually change their practice. So there's obviously still barriers in terms of willingness on behalf of either the provider and the patient to proceed with screening, the capacity of the medical system to do the screening, as well as insurance coverage. Importantly, the ACA does require insurers to cover USPSTF A and B recommended services of which this new recommendation to begin screening at age 45 falls into. And ultimately they've concluded that this is a welcome step in increasing the availability of earlier colorectal cancer screening, but that more evidence would be needed to assign an A rating. While the multi-society task force is in the process of updating their own uh, recommendations, However, they did issue a statement in 2018 in response to the American Cancer Society recommendation. And they acknowledged that starting screening at age 45 only addresses part of the risk as we are seeing colorectal cancer incidents increasing beginning at age 20. And that mainly that they were stressing that providers should focus on doing a thorough assessment of bleeding and iron deficiency anemia in younger individuals. So in conclusion, colorectal cancer is a very prevalent disease with a high mortality. It's We've been seeing that screening is effective in reducing colorectal cancer mortality and incidence, and are seeing an increased incidence in younger individuals. As I pointed out, a quarter of eligible individuals have had no screening under existing guidelines, and lowering the age of 45 will add 20 million more people into the eligible screening population. And there are obviously still many barriers and discrepancies that need to be addressed. You know, we see that patients are being diagnosed and having the first colonoscopies often over age 55, but that population group is three times more likely to be insured. There's also the problem of what do we do when we get a positive stool screening test that now requires a diagnostic colonoscopy that's in the, at least in the eyes of insurance providers and that is a significant barrier. So there obviously needs to be more focus on just other than just screening and on some of these risk factors that Dr. Isika wonderfully pointed out in her prior talk. Thank you very much.